Americans had never seen anything like the first films. In those days, we called it going to the show. It was just the, the place to be. I remember seeing Gone with the Wind here. Cowboy movies. The Roy Rogers, the Gene Autrys. Dale Evans. I liked the Doris Day. I liked any of the musicals. I never missed a war movie. The singing ones. South Pacific showboat. All the old John Wayne. John Wayne. The John Waynes. It was the coolest place in town. This program was funded by the History Colorado State Historical Fund. Supporting projects throughout the state to preserve, protect, and interpret Colorado's architectural and archaeological treasures. History Colorado State Historical Fund. Create the future. Honor the past. With support from the Denver Public Library and History Colorado. With additional funding and support from these fine organizations. And viewers like you. Thank you. Movie theaters really began to flourish in the early 20th century with the invention first of the kinetoscope by Thomas Edison in the 1880s and 1890s. And then new kinds of innovations. Movies by the 19-teens had become something that were a common public experience. Edison had really focused on Nickelodeons, on, on small one-person screens where you put in a coin and turned a crank and watched a very utilitarian film of a train pulling into a station or somebody sneezing. But in time, movie producers began to tell stories, to hire actors, to have longer and more complicated plot lines. And, and by the 19-teens, movie producers and directors were really inventing the, what we think of as the language of cinema, of intercutting and parallel action and close-ups. And so the 19-teens were really the first golden age of cinema. Colorado in, in the 19-teens was transitioning from a mining economy to more of an agricultural economy. And so these little towns on the plains really began to flourish. You could go to a town on a Saturday night and you could go to a pool hall or you could go to an ice cream parlor or you could go to a community lecture or a concert or you could go to the movies. Chillsburg is located in the extreme northeast corner of Colorado. The Hippodrome was built in 1919 by A.E. Lanning. He had a $10,000 investment into the building of the new Hippodrome. There were 17 other movie theaters in, in the county, but this was the first and only one built specifically for the movie industry. The movies uh, that were shown in the early years were your non-talking movies, your silent movies. Films in the 19-teens were black and white, although many films were hand-colored. They, they would actually tint every frame of the film so that you would actually see a colored film. And, and they were quite vivid because uh, the, the, the coloring wasn't consistent, so people's clothing would, would sort of pulse with the colors uh, of the tinting, and, and it created kind of a fantasy landscape. When the show first opened up, it featured an orchestra pit here in addition to the screen. With the silent films came the piano player that would gear the music to the action on the screen. If it was a movie chase scene, they would increase the tempo, and sometimes they just winged it. Other times they did have a score to go along with it. Films began issuing their own sheet music, their musical scores, for a musician to play as part of the film experience. It was cheap. 25 cents for adults and 10 cents for kids. The dialogue took place in title cards, which you had to read off the screen, so films were very literate. For far-flung communities like Julesburg, this was a moment for everybody to come together and share an experience. They provided common language that was unlike anything that Americans had ever experienced up to that time. The Hippodrome was the happening place to be at that time. These theaters are lavish, art deco buildings with incredibly ornate lobbies, lobbies that rival opera houses, and uniformed attendants who check your ticket and show you to your seat. When I was in junior high, I was an usher at the theater. It was so, so busy that by the time all the people start coming in, we'd have to find seats for them. So we just had a flashlight and would follow down and show them where they could sit if they couldn't find a seat on their own. Originally, the ushers at the Hippodrome, the ladies wore long gowns and it was very classy and very uptown. 
they treat you like a VIP. And the movie theaters themselves were so beautiful on the inside, so ornate on the inside, that even before the lights went out, you found yourself in a place of escape. Producers were always looking for new innovations, and by 1927, the, the, the latest and greatest innovation was synchronized sound, the, the advent of the talkies. And that changed everything for, for the film experience. The record player would start at the same time that the film would start, and supposedly it would match up. But with the film getting broken into many pieces and being spliced, the talkie audio didn't match the film that was being shown. And so they had to wait for the another film reel splice to be able to match up the talkies again with the film. Then next came um, where they actually put the audio line right into the film, and that solved all of those problems. We have one of the original projectors. There were two of them, so that you did not have an interruption. You ran one reel, and then the next reel would uh, start as soon as the other reel ended. When it was about time to switch over to the other canister, there'd be a little uh, flash of light at the corner of the film. And then uh, it was a continuous movie. And if you didn't do that at the correct time, well, there'd be a skip in the show, you know, or the film might break or something, you know, so there would be times that we'd have to turn the lights all on and, and there'd be a break in the movie. The projection booth was very tiny and cramped. When you got up into the balcony, it had a sloping floor. It was just exciting up there, but it was very noisy. You couldn't watch the movie from being in there. It was not conducive for that kind of entertainment, but it was just exciting to be up there. The original Hippodrome projector booth was lined with tin because the film at the time was silver nitrate and was flammable. And so if there was an air or something like that and the film would start on fire, the tin around the room would save the rest of the building. And there was also a window in the back of the projector booth where if the place really started on fire, he could jump out of, land on the sidewalk out in front and save his life. The Grand Theater is located in Rocky Ford, Colorado. The original theater burned down in 1934. They tell me I always thought I was eight years old, but I guess I was seven years old when the theater burned. And I remember the family come to town because we heard about it. And I stood across the street and watched what went on. And we all knew that it was taking something away that was the center of attraction in Rocky Ford. The Depression still brought people to the movies. It was still the social hub. This is where they got their news. This is where they got their information. Even during the Depression, the movie theater lasted, it thrived, and it survived. The theater here was probably one of the main things people did. Well, it was open every single day. And back in those days, they would have a movie on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, would be one movie, then they would have a different one for Sunday, Monday. I would usually just come on Saturday night. But, uh, well, if it was a good enough movie, I would come Sunday night too. It's a hard choice, especially if it was kind of a couple of westerns in a weekend, you had to come both days. You couldn't miss on, on a western. Before the main attraction, movie theaters often showed one or two newsreels and maybe a couple of cartoons, sort of the opening acts. Remember, movies came out of the idea of vaudeville where you had several acts before the main event and this was one of the last vestiges of, of that sense of vaudeville. But you had the newsreel and it was all current events. Bruno Richard Hauptmann is found guilty by a country jury of eight men and four women of kidnapping the Lindbergh baby. Justice Trenchard sentences Hauptmann to die and the prisoner nearly three years after the crime goes to the Trenton death house. Where you didn't have TV to have your nightly news, you had the newsreel. This is where farmers and ranchers and merchants got their news of the world. Especially World War I, World War II, this is where they came to get the latest news on, on the home front. The wreckage of German planes is strewn along the shallows of this coast the hot spot on the Straits of Dover. In repelling the blitzkrieg of the sky, the Royal Air Force has shot down Nazi raiders by the hundreds, and they crash all over the place. 
and the newsreels were, because of the war, were, were very necessary to communities like ours. We didn't have the, the quick news now that we get off of television and everything, so they were very important. The newsreels were not just about the war, but they were about things happening in the United States. And what I particularly remember, that it was in black and white. It kind of kept us informed of what was going on in the world. And they might include human interest pieces. Having a picnic in style, and the latest style is non-crushable linen, crisp and cool for summer. Even the news clips had a very powerful impact on how people thought about the world and how they felt about the world. It gave them something to think about and to talk about that probably lasted them well beyond the main picture. And in those days, they had cartoons and, you know, really cute cartoons. They showed the cartoons before the featured film. And the ones that I remember are the ones with the putty cat, the little bird, the cute little bird. Those were the ones that I particularly remember. And those were fun. Bank night was one of the big deals. Once a week, they would have a big pot of money that could be won. And so that obviously attracted crowds into the theater. Bank nights were a big deal. I remember people lined up to the north of the theater and clear around the senior citizens waiting to get in. And we would issue a ticket with a number on it. And then when the movie was over, somebody from the audience would draw the ticket number out of the tumbler we had. And whoever had that number then, then received the $100. And I was in here one night with a friend of mine and he won $100. In those days, it was quite a bit of money. She's the lovin'est baby around Texas, around Texas, around Texas. And the fellas all know it in Texas. That's the reason I worry each day. Hello. But of course, you also saw the first movie stars. Movie stars came from everywhere. Ken Curtis, he came to town. It was an exciting time for us because we watched him on Gunsmoke. He was born and raised at Los Animas but yet he was a big name star in our area. I just remember seeing him out in the lobby and that he was a handsome man and an actor from Hollywood. These were local boys that they were seeing up on the screen. People from their state, they could have been their neighbors at that point, who, who they were seeing up there becoming the big stars. My husband named our oldest daughter Kim because of Kim Novak. He loved a movie that Kim Novak was in. The second daughter was named Tammy. I named her because of Tammy and The Bachelor with Debbie Reynolds. Certainly farmers had to come into town from time to time to do business. There were a lot of farm families and they would mostly come in on Saturday. So they would do their shopping and they'd come get their supplies and then they would bring their whole family. We had people from Wiley, Kit Carson, Wild Horse. We had good crowds. Burlington, Kansas, Nebraska. Crowley County and Fowler and Manzanola, and Swink and Lahana. It was a family thing. It was just always busy. When I was younger, my parents raised and milked cows and we would bring the cream in to the train. Then we would go to the show. Coming to the movies was a great thing for us. And the theater used to be packed a lot of Saturday nights. We had a line, and when these much-advertised movies came out, you still drew a good crowd. And it was a place for people to meet people. It was a, re a really social hub. Oh, they'd come early and socialize. A lot of the younger ones would come early, and we had foot races out in front of the theater. Oh, down on Main Street, you would have uh, cakewalks. They had the sidewalk marked off in little squares, and the, and the school band would come down, and they would play music and then stop, kind of like musical chairs. And if you were on the number they drew out, you want a cake. Saturday matinees, 10 in the morning. You could get your kid in for a nickel or a quarter, and they can stay there for hours. For a busy parent, this was a godsend. You, you dropped your kid off at the matinee. They were there. You knew that where they were. They were in a confined space. We have uh, a very unique room upstairs called the cry room. And the cry room is designed for mothers with infants or small toddlers. They can go up and view the movie. And the sound was in there. And not a whole lot of people would fit in, but it was a wonderful thing. When the sun is setting on the prairie, my... As 
was a teenager. We had dates. We would double date and come to the picture show. I had my first date in this movie when I was 10 years old. That's the best place to take your date. We were often sent to go into the projection booth and spy, and if there was any undesirable activity going on, then we would report downstairs, and my dad would come upstairs and handle everything. He had even carted one over his shoulder from the balcony and hauled him out one night. When he came down with the flashlight, you better be all quiet, because <laughs> he would make you sit up, and he didn't want the feet on the seats or anything like that, so he took a lot of care with the theater, but he also kept us in line. We had water balloons go off the balcony one night and we had a lot of popcorn sacks that would fly over and bomb below. And the kids would sit on the opposite side of the theater and throw those milk duds across the theater at one another. One time one went almost through the screen so that that alerted us that we needed to stop selling milk duds in the concession stand. Movie theaters aren't just a spectacle for your ears and for your eyes, they're a spectacle for your taste buds as well. You didn't uh, have too much change in your pocket, but popcorn was a lot cheaper too. <laughs> the popcorn machine in our theater is an absolute focal point. I would love to know how many kettles of corn that popcorn's popped. Tastes good, good and salty. <laughs> And that's when I went to Hershey Candy Bar. <laughs> oh, one of them that I enjoyed was the Boston Baked Beans, Milk Duds. There were two glass, old-time glass dispensers that were mounted to one wrought iron base, jelly beans and peanuts. And the jelly beans were a penny and the peanuts were a nickel. This is a place to go to feast your eyes and also feast your belly. In the 1950s, television came into play. The television represented a new kind of threat to movies. You could have entertainment in your home, so I mean, it made a big difference. And it eliminated at least some of the need for people to go out and to pay for an admission ticket to watch a movie. By the late 50s, the movie attendance had definitely been impacted. When the Clip Theater originally opened, they showed movies seven days a week. Things have changed. When we got cable and we had VHS, and they have hurt our industry. Technology really basically ruined the experience of the small town theater. It really did. Technology took its toll on the movie theaters of the Plains, and in time they began to decline uh, because they felt more and more like a relic of the past. At one point, our projection system was getting old. It was not predictable, and we were broken down for several weeks. And at that point, I think people realized, gee, I don't have a place to go. Well, when they were gonna close it down, I went out of town to Yuma, to their theater for a while. I was just so glad when they got somebody that was gonna keep this one open, because I, I didn't wanna miss all the movies <laughs> coming out in this theater. When the theater closed, you know, businesses close, they kind of come and go sometimes, but when the theater closed, boy, it, we almost lost our soul or the heart of the community. My first husband and I moved to uh, Rocky Ford from California, drove down Main Street, and I said, good, there's a movie theater. And then my neighbors told me that it was closed. A year later, I heard they were going to start refurbishing it. When I first uh, came to volunteer, there was peeling paint all over, water stains on the tapestries, um, holes in the screen. We cleaned it up and had a new screen put in. And so everything was done with one thing in mind, and that is to be as close to the 1930s as we could. It was all done by, by a group of volunteers that came here every Wednesday night for months to work on this theater. And we started showing pictures in 1991.
when you live in a small town, it's really important. That's your social life and your entertainment. In 1996, when the doors were supposedly closed forever, our community roared. I had no idea at that time that I would spend the next almost 20 years working diligently to make sure that the place did stay open. We worked our tails off. We invited the school kids to come down and help clean it up. And they were troopers. They scraped gum off of the bottom of the seats. They worked really, really hard. And do you know that those kids, till they graduated, were our best patrons. When we started this epic adventure of renovation and rehabilitation, one of the easiest decisions was to go back to the original colors. We chose these colors to, to show homage and show history and a legacy to the 1919 Hippodrome. In 2003, I had a group of kids that were sophomores at the time that were a class that was challenging and they were complaining, they were whining about there's nothing to do, we don't even have a theater. And I said, well, the way I see it, you can do two things. You can whine about it, or you can whine about it and then do something about it. And little did we know what that was going to cost us in years and time and volunteer efforts. So we would come down and we would clean. It was so dusty, it was so bad, and we noticed that the murals were deteriorating. And it was very sad because we all grew up with those murals. and. So, you know, we wanted to preserve those. There was leaking going on on the wall here to the south. It was, I mean, it was crumbling. The stucco was coming off. You could see brick. It was bubbling. It was scary. And we knew that the roof was not doing well. And so we vacuumed and we scrubbed and we, we did what we could. In 2006, this, this class was going to graduate and they had a plan and they presented the plan to the community. They asked people to sign up if they were interested in helping and they went to the town after that and they went to the commissioners and they got everybody to agree. I don't know how, but they all agreed. By April, we formed a nonprofit, the Crow Luther Cultural Event Center. And after that, away we went. Preserving the murals and the tile and the popcorn machine and really anything else that we could, those stories are what tie us together from generation to generation, in fact. And when you share those, it's it's just interesting, it, it doesn't matter how old you are, how disconnected you might be. When you can share some kind of a story, it just, you can just see the people sucked back in together. Movie theaters on the plains don't have very large audiences. Um, they have a very small uh, pool of people who are going to come, and any time there's a new technological change, it's very difficult for small movie theaters to keep up. The most exciting thing now is when we we're faced with losing the theater because of converting to digital. If we wanted to stay open, we would have to go to digital because that's the only thing that was going to be available. Films, as they were, would be no more. We had to change, we had to update, we had to become more modern to survive. Go digital or go dark, convert or close. And after being in business since 1919, there was no way we were going to let this movie theater not go digital. And we didn't know where we were going to come up with around, around $100,000 to get digital, and uh, we were able to raise the money in about three months. It was pretty much raised here in the community. The history is all through this theater. Well, everybody likes to feel connected to something, and one of the first things that someone that went to high school here, they've gone on, have other jobs, but they come back they want to go to the theater. It's the memories of the people. There's something about your hometown that just, when you talk about it, you almost cry. And it's just that those happy memories, you want them to remain. And we are blessed because they're made of brick. And with every community, what is absolutely necessary is a, a sense of place. I still come to the Plains Theater today. When I'm in Eads, why I hardly ever miss a movie. I am here every Saturday night. I hate it when I have to go out of town for something. I'm not here on Saturday night. If we're in town on the weekend, we're usually at the movies. Usually we don't even care what's showing. We just go to the movies because it's $5 to get in for adults and the popcorn's a dollar. It, it has become a place to come again, to meet, to greet, to enjoy your friends. I mean, you always 
connection with, with most of the older people in town. And we're trying to get that with the younger people by some of the movies we have to keep them coming so that they'll pass it on down to their kids when they get older. Well, it's just part of our history, and I think anything we can hold on to helps us. It's tradition, and we love tradition. So it's important that my grandkids have this, and, and they will have it. Television isolates, and, and, and cinema brings us together. I have a big screen TV, and I have like a hundred and some channels. It's hard to watch all the shows on there, so you come down here and you watch one movie that you really like, and you put it away in your memory for the future. And that's what we hope the younger people will do. And remember all these movies that they saw when they were growing up like I do, and bring them back, tell their kids about them, their grandkids. So that's why we need to keep the theater around. <laughs>